if I can get the funding in the first three to 15 months, I'll perform a couple of dozen scientific experiments. A few would be more impressive proof of physics experiments. A few of these would be proof of concept experiments. Some would be engineering experiments that help me pin down things like how big and how small to make the power plants. Some experiments will prove the critical engineering aspects of these designs will work. Some will prove the safety of these designs. First, understand the key central experiment that I showed earlier in this film. A $40 experiment already proves that spherical waves exist. This demonstrates the most unique feature of my designs. Second, it is trivial to prove hemisphere coils work. Even if they didn't work, other types of coils, traditional coils, could easily be used in these designs. That is covered in my main patent. Third, my inexpensive prototype proves the important aspect of the containment circuit. It is trivial to demonstrate that a hemispheric coil induces a spherical wave to flow around the circuit. There is really nothing else that is odd or unusual about these designs. These three proof of physics experiments are critical. One of the key components of these fusion power plant designs are the hemispheric coils. They are like regular electromagnetic coils except for their geometry. It is trivial to prove they work. Still, there are variables to test. On my staff, I would hire and train a team that would become the world experts on hemispheric coils. At first, my lab will emphasize physics. Then, it will emphasize fusion. Then, it will emphasize engineering. Finally, it will emphasize economics. Unfortunately, so far at least, my inexpensive experiments have not impressed physicists. Lately, I've been wondering, if my fusion power plant designs work, then really, why do I even need to impress the physicists? If my fusion power plants are pumping out massive amounts of electricity, does it really matter if the physicists agree with my grand unification theory? From my point of view, if they eventually agree with me, it will only be the icing on the cake. The cake is the benefits the world would get from fusion. <laughs> Believe me, I can go through life enjoying that kind of cake, even without the icing. In the 12 to 18 month time frame, I want to build a proof of concept power plant that would demonstrate how a spherical electromagnetic confinement field can significantly extend fusion burn times. I doubt the physicists will be able to ignore extended fusion burn times. At least extended fusion burn times would really impress the plasma physicists. Success here would definitely ensure more funding. In the field of fusion energy research, nobody has a burn time that even lasts one second. Recently, at the National Ignition Facility, their lasers fired a pulse that lasted 23 billionths of a second. To fusion researchers, a burn time lasting one hundredth of a second would be amazing. When I talk about extended burn times, I believe my designs will eventually reach days, weeks, and even months. At first, some researchers will simply scoff at this. It requires some explanation. Exactly. What do I mean by extended burn times? Further, how would I demonstrate them? In fusion, temperatures are important. I want to discuss specifics. However, it would be a mistake for me to get too analytical in a film like this. When it comes to fusion, I want you to think in terms of four temperatures. 
First, you can start with a cool room temperature pellet of fusion fuel. At this cool temperature, the pellet is solid. Second, if the pellet is heated, at some point, it becomes a plasma. While this is hot, from most people's point of view, relatively speaking, it is a cool plasma. Third, the plasma can be heated until it is very hot. In our context, think of very hot as the hottest temperature the plasma can reach without having fusion reactions happening. Fourth, fusion. At this temperature, the plasma has become so hot that fusion reactions are happening. To recap, we have four temperatures, cold, hot, very hot, and fusion hot. Next, the term burn time might be confusing to people. Imagine taking a solid cold fusion fuel pellet and heating it. At some point, it will be so hot that the solid material transforms into a hot plasma. While it is extremely hot, the plasma is not burning. There are no fusion reactions happening or taking place in the plasma. Now, if the plasma becomes hotter, then at some point, fusion reactions will begin. As the plasma reaches its hottest and densest stage, the number of fusion reactions will peak. The tremendous energy released into the plasma will cause it to expand. Then, because the plasma has expanded, the fusion reactions will start dropping off. This allows the plasma to cool further. Therefore, the fusion reactions will drop off to zero. The plasma can still be very hot, it's just not hot enough for fusion. In this graphic, the left edge of the red zone is where the fusion reactions start. The right edge is where they stop. In between these two times, the plasma is burning. Fusion reactions are taking place. To the left and to the right of the red zone, it is a very hot temperature, just not hot enough for any statistically significant number of fusion reactions to take place. In summary, as long as some fusion reactions are happening, a fusion burn is happening. The burn time starts when fusion reactions start. The burn time stops when the fusion reactions stop. The fusion burn time is simply a measure from start to finish. Fusion burn time versus laser pulse duration. Let me point out a distinction. Researchers typically do not refer to fusion burn times. Typically, the fusion researcher's biggest concern is how long were the lasers fired. They refer to this as the laser pulse duration. So, the lasers would fire, then this would heat the fusion fuel, there would be two curves. There would be a curve for the laser energy hitting the target. It would have its own time. It would be followed by a second curve for the fusion burn. It would have its own time. In the mid-1980s, I remember reading about a fusion system that was being tested at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. It was called NOVA. It had 10 lasers. Its laser pulse durations were about 2 to 4 nanoseconds. Recently, I tried to find out how long NOVA's fusion burn times lasted, but was unable to do so. Back then, everybody was interested in laser pulse duration, not fusion burn time. Keep in mind, devices like these made absolutely no attempt to confine the plasma. There was no mechanism to extend the fusion burn time after the lasers shut off. Now, 30 years later, even in the fancy design at the National Ignition Facility, there is still no confinement circuit. After the lasers are fired, the plasma is simply allowed to explode outwards. In all of my designs, a confinement field is used to extend burn times. Call me crazy, but personally, it seems like that makes sense. That's a common sense thing to do. As an analogy, Think of an internal combustion engine. When a spark plug actually sparks, 
the spark doesn't last very long. The short spark time is like the short laser pulse duration. After the gasoline and air mixture is ignited by the spark, it burns. This burn time is much longer than the spark time. In the same way, a fusion burn time could be much longer than a laser pulse duration. By the way, how useful would internal combustion engines be if the burning fuel mixture wasn't confined by the cylinder? A key thing to consider about a burning fusion plasma is the plasma will pulse in and out. In other words, in early experiments, the time it takes for the plasma to pulse once will be longer than the duration of its fusion burn. That is why it will be important to improve the confinement circuit of my designs. A more powerful confinement circuit will shorten the pulse duration and lengthen the fusion burn. We can see that in this graphic. The stronger confinement field makes the plasma ball pulse faster. The pulse duration is shortened. The stronger confinement means the fusion burn will last longer. The fusion burn time has been lengthened. If we combine these pulses, then the fusion burn time of each pulse is still the fusion burn time, and it is short. With a little more improvement, the situation looks like this. This is exciting. In essence, the pulsing plasma is confined so powerfully that the fusion reactions continue to occur throughout the pulse. Because from pulse to pulse, the fusion reactions never stop. The fusion burn time can become extremely long. This is what will make fusion energy extremely profitable. The fusion burn times become a combination of pulses. Instead of a time on the order of nanoseconds, fusion burn times on the order of days, weeks, and months are possible. I can understand how this claim might make some fusion researchers scoff. If they only look at my claims, it might sound far-fetched. Obviously, they need to look at my reasoning. Obviously, this must be tested. Obviously, if I am right, then this is the holy grail of fusion energy.